I pray that you brought your Bibles with you today. Amen. Uh, if you would, take and turning your Bibles to John 14. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 7. Good crowd this morning. Thank you for being here. Um, this has been a, a, a fun message to prepare for. It's one that we hear a lot. We like to quote a lot. But if you would, if you've found your place, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. John 14, 1 through 7. And it says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself. And where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. But Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. I hope today as we read this passage and we look at it under new eyes, this new day, it's nothing new to be seen here, but I believe the Lord has a lot to say in this whole context of what Jesus says. I am the way the truth and the life. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word, and I just pray that you would allow us to look back some 2,000 years to that upper room when Jesus made this profound statement as the great I am, that he was the way, the truth, and the life. And I just pray that today we would understand the truths in which he was showing us how true that was, and how we are impacted by that statement. And I pray that we would listen to what your scripture says and how you have said so much to us, and I just pray that today we would hear it. And I thank you for what you're going to do in our lives and in our, in our, in our walk. And Lord, in especially if there's one here today that doesn't know you as the Lord and Savior that came to this world to take away the sins of the world I pray that we would listen and I pray that person would be touched in a special way through the Holy Spirit draw him or her in a way that they would say yes to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and it's in his name that we pray amen you may be seated you know, this message, I've, I've preached the way, the truth, and the life multiple times, uh, different times in my ministry uh, to kids and everything. And it's pretty easy if as a pastor you can sit down and read that when God gives you three different, uh, there's a comma there, it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, you could actually add a fourth point saying, I'm the only way. And it would be easy to lay out that message, and I've done that before, but I didn't have peace about that when I was in my study and I read this passage. It was the next I am as we've been preaching the message on I am. And I, I felt conviction to not just go what was easy, uh, which would have been very easy to do. But um, my heart, you know, Jesus has, has been teaching his disciples for three years. And he's trying to get them to a place that they understand this. And when I was studying this, I believe that when we read this, sometimes we lose what Jesus was actually doing in the upper room there. Yes, he is the truth. It is the truth that he is the way, the truth, and the life. But I don't think that's all he's saying. And that was where I had my conviction. And I said, Lord, show me what it is that you're trying to, to say to your people today. And I started reading and I started backtracking and, you know, the, as you read a passage, you go back to the paragraph and then you go to the verses before and verses after. I went chapters to really understand the context of what the great I am is saying here in the upper room and the full effect of what he is saying. We have to go back two chapters to pick this up. 
If we go back to John chapter 12, verses 20 through 26, all through the ministry, and the first time when, when the ministry actually started and, and he went out and he went to the, the wedding at Cana, and, and Mary asked him to turn the water into wine uh, or to produce wine, and, and he says, my time is not yet come. But we've been waiting on Jesus to say, my time has come. And that's what he does here in John chapter 12. It says, now among those who went up to the worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Phil Philip, who was uh, from Bethesda in Galilee, and asked him, sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, and he says, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. His time for the reason that he was coming was upon him. His teaching was coming to a close. It was time to act, to set in action the events that would change the entire universe forever, ever, and ever. And he said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there, he will, there will my servants all be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So in this passage, we see that Jesus has just told them that he's about to die, that the fruit of the Father would be reproduced through his death being placed into the ground, and then the resurrection of new life that we know the story now because we know the ending. But I believe if we take just a moment and we back up and just when Jesus is in the upper room, he's surrounded by his apostles. And he's about to just kind of tell them, hey, things about to radically change for you and for the rest of eternity. I want you to listen to what I'm saying. And Jesus, we get to that place that we understand that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And why do we know that? Well, in John chapter 13, verses 31 through 35, this is just a few verses before we get into chapter 14. He said, when he, Judas, Judas was the one that betrays Jesus, had gone out, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified. And God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, Jesus himself, you know, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while will I be with you. Now he's, he's gotten to the place, he calls them children. He is their leader. And he's wanting them to listen very intently to what he's about to say. He says, you will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. That would be devastating for those that had been following him for the three years. They knew that he was the Messiah. And then he says some very powerful words. He says, a new commandment I give you. That you love one another just as I have loved you and also our love that you love one another. By this people will know that you are my disciples. Now the key that we need to get out of this little verse is that as, their, as his disciples, they should be able to teach that he is the way, the truth, and the life. It wasn't that he wanted them to know who he was. They knew who he was. They just didn't want to grasp it. They didn't want things to change. We all hate change, don't we? He's trying to get them to see the validity of who he was, why he was here, and what he was about to do. The band didn't want to break up. They all said, no. He had already kind of rattled them all and said, one of you are going to betray me. But once Judas had left and Jesus continues his conversation with them, he says, I'm about to leave you. And I'm going to give you a new commandment. And this means that you need to do this. You need to love one another. And sometimes our actions speak a whole lot more louder than our words do. Would you not agree with that? Amen. 
I believe sometimes if we get the true statements that Jesus makes and stop focusing on how it's just me and how it impacts us in a way that it's not just that we are followers of Christ as disciples, but how we impact those around us, we become disciple makers. We should show people how to get to heaven, should we not? We need to show them the way, the truth, and the life. As a young eight-year-old boy, somebody told me that I was a sinner. And the moment that I understood that what sin was and that Jesus died to wash those sins away, I said, yes, I want to follow Jesus as the Lord, the boss of my life. But the point is, is that I was to learn everything I could about him, that I was to read my Bible, I was to go to church, that's the reason I love that song, I'm at home when I'm in the house of the Lord. Because those that believe the same way I do have come together to lift up the name of Jesus in a way that we can say He is the way, the truth, and the life. Do we look at Jesus as the way we want to live our lives? That's a challenge all of us. In, or, or when we leave the door here, we say, yeah, have, thank you, have, hope you have a good week. And we leave church. And then we go to the world. Or do we follow the directions of the great I am who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus had already told them he was about to leave. This was the reason he was here. This is why he wanted them in the upper room so he could spend some special time with them to encourage them to set in motion the events that were to come to pass in the next 48 hours and then for eternity. And how that not only implied what he was to do, but what they were to do. And that's a challenge that we have to follow. The verses go on in verse 36 there in chapter 13 of John. And Simon Peter said, I love Peter. He gets all puffed up, you know, good old sailor. Lord, where are you going? Matter of factly, I believe he did it. And Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot go with me now. But you will follow afterward. And Peter just, he said to the Lord, he says, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Doesn't that sound like Christians? I'll lay down my life for you, Lord. I'll do this, that, and the other. We use the phrase, we'll, we'll charge the gates of hell with a water pistol. We're just that, that zealous about the Lord. But we don't understand what it is that he wants us to do. You see, Jesus, he sits there and he says to Peter, he said, I will, he said, I'll lay my down. Jesus answers, will you lay down your life for me? I think he genuinely knew that Peter meant well. And he said a lot of things. And he didn't even bring it out here, but here in just a few moments, he's going to fall asleep when Jesus asks him to watch him pray in the garden. And, and, and Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. How many times in our lives do we say, I am, I understand and I know Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. How many times do we get on our, our righteous soapboxes and we, we get all indignant about it? And I believe that's very important that we do stand for the way, the truth, and the life. But can people look at you Monday through Saturday and say they know the way, they know Jesus. I believe they're going to heaven. Have you ever thought about people looking at you at that, in that way? That's what Jesus is trying to get the disciples to see there in the upper room. It's not that I'm going to the cross. I am. It's not that I'm going to die and to, to wash away the sins of the world. I am. But your job as disciples is to go out and tell others what I have done. To help them see the way, the truth, and the life. You see what the challenge I had this week in my office? Praying about this message. Because we know who Jesus is. But I want us to focus on who Jesus was talking to. Not just the, the, the 12 or well, 11 apostles at that moment. There were other disciples in that room, I believe. 
I've heard some teachers say there was upwards of 100 people in that upper floor. We don't know. But here's the thing. That room and that event that covers several chapters in the Gospels affect us today. What he said in that upper room is his, his leaving statements before he was, uh, would go and pray in the Garden of Gethsemane and then be taken to a mock trial. We're going to be celebrating Resurrection Sunday here in a couple of weeks. And, but he, he has to go to the cross to make the way. And we, we've seen that over the past few weeks. I do believe that we know the truth and the way and the life. I believe it does lead to heaven. I believe we need to know that. But I would argue with you to stand for what is the truth is that we are to be the ones that are pointing the way as well. So I wanted to consider something. That was a sermon in itself, was it not? But I believe if we plow the ground well enough, maybe, just maybe, some seed will land on fertile soil. And I believe it won't be rocky. If you're sitting here and you're all puffed up and you're thinking, well, I know all that. I want you to have the conviction that I had this past week. We do know that. We do know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And I don't think we have a problem with that. I'm looking here. We do have a visitor here, but he hugs Susan, so I guess she knows him. Uh, but the thing is, is you're church folk, Okay. I'm glad you're here. You see, we as church folk need to have somebody with us when we come to church. I'm guilty. I didn't bring nobody this morning. I believe there are times that we need to give directions. I believe there's times that we have to point out who we believe the way, the truth, and the life is. Sometimes we just go on our merry way and we don't care if anybody makes it. And I believe that's what Jesus is trying to get them to see there in the upper room. So I ask the question on the back of your bulletins uh, is my outline, uh, but I laid out there to consider what are your directions to God? We're, we like to say in the, in the church, you know, we're going to heaven. Amen. I know the way. I know the truth. I know the life. And we consider that. But what are your directions? If somebody stopped you and said, how do you get to heaven? Could you tell them? Could you point the way that they might go and see the Father face to face someday? That's a question that we need to all uh, answer today. And there's a few points, and this won't take very long, I don't believe. Point number one, do you believe the directions? And Jesus said there in uh, verses 1 and 2 of our text, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. That many rooms, we have here many mansions. The Greek word means abode. We're going to live with God Almighty, okay? Don't worry about the mansion. Don't worry about the streets of gold. Don't worry about all those things. Jesus is going to be there. That's who I want to see first. God's going to be on his throne. At some point, we will get our glorified body. You see what I'm saying? That is what heaven's about. It's not about a mansion, and it's not about the streets of gold. It's about the ones that we live with, we abode with. And Jesus is trying to say this, and he says, If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? I love that passage. I'm going to go fix a place up for you. That where you are, where I am, ye may be also. That's a promise from Jesus himself. So when we're going to make a trip, do we believe the directions we've been given? Jesus has said this, and we understand the previous verses that I've already read. When you go to make a trip, what do you do? You know, some people might still get a map and a compass. I can do that. I don't know. Many, Gavin, I don't think would have, he'd have a problem with a map and a compass. Uh, we might go to AAA and get us a trip ticket. You know, it tells us where all the neat stops are and all that along the way. We might, and what we like to do now is Google Map or some kind of map or GPS system. 
But this has all been prepared by somebody else. They've put the time in and helped you understand the direction in which you might want to go. But nobody knows the directions to somebody's house better than the person that lives there. Amen? Would you agree with that? I mean, they're going to tell you, you go down to this road, you make a right. They're going to tell you the landmarks to look for. I like landmarks. I'm a country boy. There's a big red barn there that says, how are y'all on the side of it? Make a right right there, okay? Those are directions that you can grab a hold of, and it's visual. You can see it, and you know, and you believe the directions in which you've given because somebody's been there and has seen the way. And they know that the true route in which they need to go. And life is so much better when you're not lost. Would you not agree with that? I believe sometimes we don't believe what God has given us and what he has told us. And we, we put aside the things that God lays on our hearts and we just, we can say, I got it figured out. Us men are bad about that. How many times men have we heard, stop and get directions. Well, I got directions before we left, but you're not believing them because you're lost. I believe we need to follow what God has given us. Jesus said in previous messages that I've talked in this I Am series that he was the bread of life. He gave us his word to give us the directions in which we could, we could find our way. Amen. The road map that we need. And not only that, but he said, I am the light. The lights that you go. When you get in the car at night, do you not turn the lights on? You're going to end up in the ditch if you don't. And, I, I, you know, the things that we, t we don't put into play, what God has given us, and the, the church answer is yes, we believe that Jesus is the bread of life. We believe that he is the light. And we believe that he is the way, the truth, and the life. But the great I am is re re telling us the directions that gives us the word that we can find the way and that the light that convicts sin, that we can change and make our destination in a timely manner and to stay on track. You know, you might get to the point A. We might be leaving point A to get to point B. Now, how many fields you end up going down through or how many back alleys you end up on and all this other stuff is because you didn't follow the directions or you didn't have your lights on. And I believe to understand this, to believe the directions that we have, we must listen. How many of us like to hear what we want to hear? We call it selective hearing. I believe sometimes we need to listen to more what Jesus and God has told us through his word. Isaiah 30, 21 says, And your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, This is the way, walk in it. It's the Lord saying, This is the way I want you to go. When you turn to the right or when you turn to the left, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be pointing the directions that you need to go. Now, why would he be telling you which way to go? We're going to heaven, amen? It's so we can help others to find the way as well. How many do you think are following you? My goal for everybody in this room, under the voice that I'm preaching right now, is that you're being a road map, a beacon, a light on the side of a hill that Jesus talked about in, on the Sermon in the Mount. I believe that we are to be a light that people are focusing on like a lighthouse and they're going to follow us. And not that they can see us, but that they can see the light of the world. Amen? Jesus. And if we are listening, then we also need to be able to visualize what it is that he's saying. When we hear a verse, do we visualize how we are impacted by that verse? Do we visualize how this verse can change the course of our lives? Do we, do we visualize what it is that Jesus is doing in us to help someone else? In Psalm 119, verse 105, we read, The word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We write that in Bibles. We, we use that verse a lot. Psalm 119 is all about the word of God. Showing us how to see how important it is in our lives. Too many of us in church, we still do not believe the directions given by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The directions that we believe, are they ours or are they God's? Stop changing the directions to sound better to you. Okay? That's a challenge. Speak the truth. It will show the way.
and it will bring life. Speak the directions in which God gives us. John 6, 29 says, This is the work of God that you believe in him who has sent, who was sent. I think it's important that we believe the directions in which we've been given. Secondly, I think it's important that uh, we desire the directions. I just said it a while ago, man, we have a problem getting directions. We have to desire directions. We have to desire to make the right turns. We have to desire to do it the right way in accordance with God's word. In our text, verses 3 through 5, it says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. I love that part. Are you looking for him to come back? And will take you to myself that where I am, ye may also be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. You know the way. And then Thomas, we always, he gets labeled the doubting, doubter, you know. But he stands up and he says this, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? It's a valid question. And it's a valid statement that, 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 that Thomas is saying here. And I want you to understand that Thomas knew just as much as anybody else in that room, whoever that might have been, Peter, James, John. But they all knew who Jesus was. He was the Messiah. He was the Christ. He was the one that had come, as John the Baptist had said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. They knew that, but they needed to desire to do it God's way. They needed to desire to follow what Jesus had said over the last three years of his ministry. They had front row seats. Can you imagine sitting in a room, listening to Jesus talk about heaven, talk about what was to come? I can only imagine. Oh, what times that'll be. You know, that's the things that I, I, when I read Scripture, I try to go back and try to imagine what it was like to be sitting at his feet like Mary was and just taking in every word that he said. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. What does that mean to me? What does that mean to the one that's sitting beside me to my left or to my right? You see, we have to desire the directions in a way that it changes how we feel towards the directions that we've been given. As we continue the theme of I am, have you entered at the door? Jesus said, I am the door. Have you met the I am who called himself the good shepherd? Have you entered in and tasted what he gives and how he protects and how he provides? It's not always about monetary things. But he gives us a peace that passes all understanding. That's what the I am is all about. That's the reason why he is the way, the truth, and the life. It's not about us and what we can do. We have to desire what Jesus has done for us. It's only in Jesus and Jesus alone that we can have this life that is eternal. But we like to say that we want to Keep it the way it is. I don't want to change anything. Well, if we go out and start bringing people in that we don't know, they might change the look of our church. That's okay. It's God's church. And if he wants us to go out and bring somebody in here, sheep are just not real bright. We've pointed that out last week. We need to bring some more sheep in here so we can help, help corral them and help them to see the door. And help them to see the great I am, the good shepherd, in which they can be helped by the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But we don't want change. And just like Thomas didn't want change, he says, we don't want you to go is what he's saying. We don't know where you're going. We want things to stay the way they are. So many times that's the way Christians are in their churches. We don't want change in our church. I don't know about you. But I'm sitting here looking into the congregation here. And I'm trying to visualize as I'm sitting here. There's one, two, three, four. Four people that was in the, on here on the first Sunday that I preached. And look how many other people are in here. See, change is good. I miss all those. 
that are not here. I was telling uh, I was telling Enrique this morning. If we had everybody that we had brought into this church, either through salvation, through witnessing, through just inviting people to church, you know, we'd be running over a hundred right now. I was sitting there looking at my records the other day and was just in awe at how many people have come and gone. Some of them are in heaven now. They're in a better place anyway. You see, when we desire the directions to go out and bring people in, we can show them the directions that Jesus gives. And it's not about us getting there. We're here. Amen. You're here. Thanks to you. Glory to God. But here's the thing. You need to desire to take somebody else with you. The trip's always better when you've got somebody with you. Amen. I believe it's important that we see that. And if we're doing it our way, James 4 verse 14 says, Where is, uh, you know, uh, whereas you know not what tomorrow brings. Amen. We don't know what tomorrow holds. What is your life? Is it even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away? What is your mission in life? What is it that God's got you doing? Are you showing the way, the truth, and the life? You see, the problem is we have treasures that get in the way sometimes. Where are your treasures? What you desire is your treasure. And the things that you desire, Matthew 6, we read, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth. Where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where neither moth nor rust destroys and the thieves that they, they can't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Amen. Let me give you a visualization of what that means. You will stand before Jesus as a born again believer. Your sins have been washed away. The great I am is taking care of that. You become a disciple. And what it is, is when you stand before Jesus at the Bema seat, and he's going to say, how well did you run the race? How many people did you show the way to the cross? How many, how many, now think about this. How many did you sacrifice yourself to reach in order that they could be here with you? See, when we stand before Jesus, we're not judged for our sins. We're judged on how we use the directions that he gave us. Amen. We're judged on how we knew the great I am. Amen. And that is why when we sit here and we think about our treasure in heaven, it's not gold, it's not things. Even the jewels themselves, and I've heard people say, how many jewels you'll have in your crown and all that. It doesn't matter. We're going to cast those crowns at Jesus' feet anyway. But I want you to understand that we have to answer for what our treasure is in our lives. What truly holds your desire? Matthew 6, we read there, it's, uh, it says, The eye is the lamp to the body, so if your eye is healthy, the whole body is full of light. But if your eye is bad and the whole world, uh, body will be full of darkness. Uh, and in the light, you, it, it, if then the light is your, you is darkness, how great is the darkness? That's a question. If you don't have the light of Jesus, it's very dark. No one can serve two masters. Either they will hate the one and love the other, or they will devote the, to the one and despise the other. And that's true. That's evident in Christians all around the world. It says, you cannot serve God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor about your body or what you'll put on it. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? I talked about being visual about what we believe. Your treasure and what's important to your life will be resonating on how you know the way, the truth, and the life. Do you desire to show others the direction? Matthew 6, verse 33 says, But the, seek ye the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Life doesn't mean nothing here on this earth. I'm looking forward to the kingdom, amen? I'm looking forward to meeting all those that have gone before me, that had a part in me saying yes to the King of kings and Lord of lords. I'm looking forward to sitting down with Peter and said, did you really get that puffed up? 
I don't know what we'll talk about, but I'm just sure there's conversations that'll take place. I look forward to that, but I look forward to those young children I had a part in Awanas, that they come to know Jesus through learning the Scripture. Somebody showed them the way, the truth, and the life. I'm looking forward to the teenagers I've had an opportunity to work with, that they changed their lives, and some of them are preachers now, that they said, you showed me the way to the truth and the life. See, those are the things that our treasure should be about, and that should be what we desire as we look to heaven. Amen? Point number three, you need to know the directions. I asked you earlier, if somebody asked you how to get to heaven, could you sit down and show them the way to heaven? It's not a hard question. I don't... If you don't know the answer to that, get me later or get somebody that you know that is rooted in the Word of God. If you can't give a Bible answer for the reason why you are going to heaven, you need to come and talk to me or somebody that can help you to understand how to lead somebody else to the very heaven that you're going to. I believe it's important that we know the directions. Jesus himself in verses 6 and 7 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. And there's a period there. For, and I love this last verse. And I've really never focused on this. And it says, from now on, you will know him and have seen him. From now on. The first time you get a taste of heaven is that first time that God indwells you with the Holy Spirit. That first love that first desire to be an obedient follower of Jesus Christ himself. It's when we, we try to doctor it up or we try to add to it and, and, and we try to do the things of the world and the things of church and just make a mess of things, if you will. When we sit down and we say, I know who he is, and we can fervently say that I know who Christ is. And here's how he changed my life. And we don't tell them how, what we did. But we tell them what the word says. That if we confess Jesus as Lord. There's so many things that we put in the direction. And it's only in Christ alone that we can find our way to heaven. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 10 it says for by grace you've been saved through faith and this is not of your own doing it is a gift of God not of a, a result of works so that no one can boast. We like to boast don't we? Look what I did. We don't do anything. Jesus did all the work there on the cross did he not? For we are his workmanship. He did a work in us. He did something to change us. He, he gave us a light and he gave us salt that we can change a dying and dark world created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He gives us the way, the truth, and the life that we can go help others find their way. That's what he's telling his disciples there in the upper room. His time had come. I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to die. Hallelujah, I'm going to raise. And I'm going to walk the earth. And I'm going to have and I'm going to conquer the grave and death. And we're going to live eternally together. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And when we find that way and we get excited about it, and I hope you get excited about it, and we can move forward and people are going to say, I wonder what's got them so excited. You know, we should be like we found a pot of gold out here in the backyard and we're just back here and everybody's saying, what are they digging up? We shouldn't be hiding it. We shouldn't be saying it's mine. What we have is greater than anything this world has to offer. And we should freely be pointing to the cross and saying, this is the way. This is the only truth, as bloody and as ugly as it may be. It is the only way through Jesus Christ that we might have life eternal. Yeah. It's our job to sit there and show the directions are your directions all about Jesus? Acts 4.12 says, Is there a salvation? There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven in, uh, among men by which we must be saved. 
People say, how do I get to heaven if, you're, if your directions have anything other than Jesus? Well, you need to go to church. You've got to put some money in the offering. You've got to do the Lord's table. You've got to be baptized. All these things are of man. It's only in Christ and Him alone that we can have the way, the truth, and the life. Do you know that you know that you know that you've got going to heaven? You know the directions? 1 John 5, verse, start with verse 13. I write these things to you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. Hallelujah. I know the directions. And this is the confidence that we have toward Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. Last night I got a call out as a chaplain for the sheriff's office. A young man had hung himself, committed suicide. The family was broken. You can only imagine. There was a sister that had literally, she just started screaming, running around in the road. They had to actually put her in handcuffs and put her in a cruiser to protect her. When things like that happen, we don't have the answers. But you know what? I was able to talk. I'd go, I was going from family member to family member to family member saying, you know, and one of them told me, he said, he just got saved not too long ago. And we start saying, well, this is a funny way for somebody that just got saved to act. This world is so twisted. And the thoughts of this world are so adverse to the ways of God. that He just was confused. I don't know. He might be in heaven with Jesus right now. But I know that family was in a very, very dark place. And I tried to share with as many of them as I could how they could know that they could be with their loved one again if he was in heaven. You see, there's, a, there's an opportunity that each one of us, as we come into a dark time, we see somebody that's struggling or having a hard time, and, and, and we can sit there and say, hey, I know the way to heaven and we can help them and share with them. doesn't mean it's going to take away that problem. It just means that we're showing them the way to heaven. This world is not what it's about. If you haven't figured that one out yet, it's what we're going to. we got such and so much more to look forward to in heaven. This world might seem, and it might have our desires, it might have our interests, it might have all of our treasures and everything else. I hope you're not one of those when you die and you go to heaven and say, wow, I didn't know it was going to be like this. We have a challenge to know the directions and what it is that we're going to. That passage, we like to quote it, and we stop there most of the time, but it goes on to say, and if you know that and hear us in whatever we ask, we know that you have the request that you have asked of him. If you know the way, you know the one that's give you the directions, Amen. If you've desired him and his directions, he'll give you the ability to know how to share with others. So I'd ask earlier when we started this, what are your directions to God? What are your directions to God? My application is Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 8. I believe it's a passage that we can live by. I believe it's a passage that Solomon give us and then through the Holy Spirit that tells us exactly what it is that we're here for. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on the, unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Some people have told me, you know, you give up so much about life here on earth to be a Christian. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm challenged through Scripture to sacrifice myself multiple places. We talked about it a little bit in Sunday school this morning. But here's the thing. If I live for Christ and I die and heaven's not there, I might have missed a few things here on earth. No big deal. 
I'll be honest with you, I'm happy. I've enjoyed my life. I've had my ups and my downs just like everybody. But I've had a good life. And I believe it's because of Christ. Amen. And I can live with that. Well, let me, let me share something with you, though. Some of those people who say, I would rather live now than for eternity. And they die, and what I've lived has been true all these years, that I know the way, the truth, and the life through Jesus Christ. And I get to heaven, and he says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That one that said, No, I'd rather live for this day, this time, for this flesh, me, myself, and I. If I'm going to live for that and you die and you find that you have to face Jesus face to face, what are you going to say? Because when you close your eyes in death, it's over. You can't go back, well, I need to redo. We like to do redos. Or what's, what's the golf term? Mulligan. Let me shoot that one again. We can't do that. We have to make a decision now, today. See, the Lord give us in that psalm that we sing today, I will, or said today, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. Amen? Amen. That's instructions. He's going to show us the way to go. Our problem is we don't like to follow. We like to kick, run the other direction. No, not now. See, I believe that the whole understanding of Jesus, the great I am, said, I am the way, the truth, and the life was that we can take the truth that we know and share it with somebody else. And as he shows us the directions, maybe to somebody that we're to show directions, or maybe just show us a better way to go than what we're going, that others might say, hey, I can follow that. I believe we all have a challenge, amen? I believe we all have a part in what Jesus said there in the upper room. Can you say you know the ways to God, amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much. You don't leave it for us to figure out. Thank you so much for that. We, thank, we are thankful for Jesus. Yes, he was the lamb in which would take away the sin of the world. But Lord, he was the word before that. He was there at the beginning as the foundations were laid. As eternity future was sought Lord, sin didn't take you by surprise. You knew exactly what was going to happen. But Lord, let us find in ourselves the obedience and the surrender to follow the way, the truth, and the life. Let us change our lives in a way that we not only follow Jesus, but we, we shine on a dark world that shows others the way, the truth, and the life. Let us resonate the truths of that upper room in our own lives. Let us show others how Jesus gave himself for us. As we look forward to Resurrection Sunday and the things that will take place between now and then in Scripture and in, in those final chapters of the Gospels, Lord, let us not take that for granted. The greatest gift that was ever given was your Son. Oh, Lord, let us not take that for granted. Let us tell others about it. Maybe there's somebody here today that needs to make that decision today. I pray that they would be bold and strong, and they would settle that here before they leave this building. I pray your Holy Spirit has been drawing them. I pray your Holy Spirit has been convicting. But, Lord, I just pray your Holy Spirit is saying, this is the truth. I have your way, and we thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing a hymn, Have Thine Own Way. And Miss Natalie's going to.